So we are super excited to have Pete Hall with us here this morning. Um, and he will also be our keynote um, at our opening day. And so we'll get to hear from him again, um, which we're also really excited about. But Pete Hall is a capacity builder driven to impact others' lives in a profoundly positive way. He channels his experiences as a school principal, life coach, and small business owner into manageable lessons for continuous growth, personal improvement, and positive mindset. Tenacious, courageous, Pete shares his optimism, joy, and practical application of strategies for getting the most out of yourself as a leader, a contributor, a teammate, and a human being, no matter what your role and goals might be. With a down-to-earth personality and humorous anecdotes, he weaves his tactical work-life approaches and clear mental shifts into every nook and cranny of his interactions with others. Mr. Hall's written works include authoring over 20 articles on leadership and publishing 11 books, including Fostering Resilient Learners with Kristen Sowers, which we had some copies here. It looked like a few of you took them um, as the giveaways, but we do have some more copies. So round of applause and thank you, Pete Hall. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? I just have one question that I want to start y'all with uh, before you get into any of my content or anything that I'd like to talk to y'all about. What are you doing here? Like, no, I'm serious about that. Why are you here? I want you to think about that for a second because it's the tail end of summer. We're still a little bit of, we still have a little bit of room, don't we, between now and when kids show up and when you're required to report back for work, right? So you're here. You decide, You made the decision to come here to engage in professional learning, to see each other. We saw that some of you hadn't seen each other in a while because there were some lengthy embraces during some of the um, your greetings as you came in and when Wendy gave you some breakouts that it's just nice to see that human piece of us back together again, right? So I really want to challenge you to answer that question for a moment, just to think about that. What is it that drew you to be here today and or tomorrow to engage in professional conversations, to learn, to sharpen your saw, to think about something, to engage with, with each other? Because you could have been on the boat, you could have kicked your feet up, you could have been drinking something with a little colored umbrella in it or something. You could have been doing all sorts. Some of y'all are doing that actually right now. No, you could have been doing whatever else that you could have been doing and you've chosen to be here. So I want to take a moment, like Wendy did at the very beginning, to say thank you for doing that, and thank you for being here, and thank you for your commitment to kids and your profession. I also want to give you the opportunity to really center yourself on that, that reason, that rationale, and your purpose for being here. Because when you've set a purpose, when you've been clear on why you're doing something, you're much more willing to get something powerful out of that experience. So you're going to be here for the rest of two days, right? Or at least the rest of today, or at least the rest of the morning, or at least the next... 35 minutes, and then we'll see what you get out of that. So I want to invite you just to take a moment right now and to reflect and to think. And if you're the kind of person that reflects well with somebody else, you want to talk it through, just lean over and have a quick conversation with a neighbor to answer the question, why are you here? So take a moment to do that. You can engage in some self-reflection if you want to. That's fine. You No one here. No, you're good. Whatever works. Whatever works. Absolutely. <clears throat> You were in charge of getting everyone seated. No, I wasn't. You were the last one to sit down. Is that baby? You saw that.
All right, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Thank you so much for taking that moment and just being in this space and for being here and being centered and, and understanding why you're here and what you want to get out of these two days. Um, if it's all right with you, I'm not using a slide deck or PowerPoint or anything. We're going to go old school and just interact like human beings. Right, and that's the way I like to think of it when I come to a, a, a workshop totally unprepared. So, what we're gonna do, I'm just kidding. I wanna give a shout out to Wendy, by the way. Wendy's a really close friend of mine and a colleague of mine. What a fabulous session, right? And I don't know about you, but I had this moment several times while Wendy was talking this morning. I'm like, man, I wish there were a template for that. Oh, I wish you shared a resource about this. And then she whips out a wakelet that has like a hundred different things and a bazillion different resources. That, that was awesome. That was incredible. So I, I appreciate that. I'm going to use some of those things in a, a session that I have coming up next week that is uh, it's perfect timing. So I am not, I, I've co-authored a couple books on childhood trauma. I'm not an expert on trauma. However, I am a recovering school principal, so I am an expert on stress, All right? So we, when we work through how our brains, and this session is called uh, Trauma Savvy Brain Smart. Is that what it's called? Uh, okay. Um, we need to know about trauma, and we need to know about stress, and there are things that we can do to mitigate the harmful effects of trauma and stress on our brains, on our kids, on ourselves, on our families, on our communities, on our schools, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it, if we could just say, you know what, the actual solution to this, which I believe is true, is to make the world less traumatic. If we could do that, that would alleviate the need for us to build and develop resilience and to teach resilience in others. The reality is, that's not under our James Spader, right, and Megan Boone. Well, there was a scene in there in which um, Liz's father had passed away. We didn't know them, but Reddington had killed him. But Liz's father had passed away, and so Reddington was sitting next to her on the swing set. Those of you who watched the show remember this. And she was forlorn and dejected and sad, missing her father. And he says, right now, when you wake up in the morning, that's the first thing you think about, is how much you miss your dad and how sad you are. There will come a day, well, that's the second thing you think about. And that I thought was the most interesting TV show advice for us as we go through trauma and stress is remembering that light at the end of the tunnel that there will come a time that the hurt doesn't go away, it just becomes less prominent. And that's what that tolerable stress is designed to do. So going through a global pandemic, that's tolerable stress. Losing your job and having to find a new job, tolerable stress, maybe even the job hunt was tolerable stress, right? And then there's that toxic stress, and toxic stress is when our, and for our children, toxic stress is when they're in abusive homes, when they're in situations that are difficult, and they no longer see the light at the end of the tunnel. They don't believe there's going to be a brighter day, right? And this experience impacts us. It affects us. And Wendy started talking a little bit about the brain today, and you heard from Dan Siegel about the hand model of the brain. One of the most powerful things that we can do to help our kids to understand how they are experiencing this stress and how they are experiencing emotions is to teach them the language of what's going on inside their brain. So we can teach kids as young as two and three years old about neurobiology. How many of you have ever worked with little, little kids that can tell us they need to use the bathroom? Right? Y'all work in the pre, pre, super K? Yeah. Well. If our kids can tell us, hey, I feel a little funny, something's going on, then they can also tell us, hey, I feel a little funny, something's going on, right? I feel a little dysregulated. We can teach that, and it's amazing when we see that. And if two, three, four-year-old kids can, so can second grade, third grade, fourth grade, eighth grade, 16th grade, whatever grade kids, 38th grade kids, as 
I've got a daughter who's a professional student. So they can just keep learning and learning and learning, and they can describe that. So what I'd like to take a moment to have you do is to recall what Dan Siegel was telling us about the hand model of the brain. And in particular, I want to add two different bits of the language to make it very explicit. One is upstairs brain. And some of y'all know, how many y'all know about the upstairs brain and the downstairs brain and have gone through this language before? All right, some of you have, some of you haven't. All right, so I want to take a moment and make sure that we reinforce that with each other. So I'd like you to pair up with somebody and I want you to have about a conversation for about two, two and a half minutes in which you go through the upstairs brain, the downstairs. You don't have to remember stuff about the subcortical region of the limbic system or the prefrontal cortex or any of that. Just the big ideas of rational, reasonable, regulated, dysregulated, and then at, at risk for becoming regulated or dysregulated and why that's important for kids. You and your partner, two, two and a half minutes, just make sure you and your partner have a solid understanding of this hand model of the brain. And I'd like to challenge you to think of a way that you either use this on a regular basis with kids in your setting, in your classroom, in your office, in your hallway, in your cafeteria, wherever you are, with find yourself with kids, and or ways that you might implement this language and hand signals with kids. Fair enough? Questions? All right, take two, two and a half minutes, find a partner, and you and your partner make sure that you clearly understand that hand model of the brain. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I hope you had an opportunity to engage that with each other on that a little bit. I want to tell you about a story. I mentioned I'm a recovering principal. I want to tell you a principal story. Uh, I took over as principal of a middle school, seventh and eighth grade kids, 600 kids. The year before I took over as principal, there were over 4,000 office referrals for disciplinary purposes. There were over 700 out-of-school suspensions. 
And it, when I share these data with non-educators, so corporate folks and leadership folks from different arenas in life, they, they always say the same thing. Oh my gosh, that must have been a really tough neighborhood. You must have had some gang activity or something. There must have been stuff going on. I'm like, yeah, well, I got stories for all that stuff. Like the time the, the police came to the school to arrest the kid who stole the car because he drove it to school and parked. This middle school, he had, he, they came to him, they're like, where's the car? They're like, it's in the staff parking lot. Anyway, so yes, I have stories about that. However, when I share those data with educators, educators are almost unanimous in saying, hey, uh, that's not a kid problem. That's a grown up problem. If our recourse is to send kids out when they can't manage and stay regulated, if we can't help them stay in the classroom, and then when they get to the office, if we can't control them there, we send them home, it's no surprise that the, kid, the school wasn't doing well. Kids aren't learning stuff, right? So one of the first things we did is, what, how can we help get kids regulated? So that became my number one charge. And as principal, I had a lot of kids come into my office early on for disciplinary purposes. And I knew my job was to get them regulated. So I had all these tips and tools and tricks and strategies. I was teaching them about the upstairs brain and downstairs brain. And kids were coming in. I was giving them time. They had different devices. We had water and we had music playing and all that soothe. Then we could interact, right? So that was my job. And once they were regulated, I always ask the same question. And those of you who are administrators, think about the extent to which you use this question. So what could you have done differently, right? Instead of kicking, throwing, cur cursing, whatever, right? And when kids are regulated, can't they just give you a whole bevy of ideas? Like, I could have done this, I could have done that, I could have asked for help, I could have asked for a timeout, I could have walked away, I could have sent it, I could have counted to 10 backwards in Spanish, blah, blah, blah. And that, at that point, then I'm thinking, well, if you had all those strategies, why'd you pick the kick the teacher one? Because that doesn't seem... So then I'm thinking, well, maybe you did it on purpose, and now you're in trouble. Not only are you in trouble for what you did, it was premeditated, because you had all this. So it wasn't going well. Right, Kids could explain it. And then as I learned more and more about the brain and the biology of stress, I realized that when we're regulated, we can see all those options. When we're dysregulated, we can no longer see those options. It becomes a matter of flight, fight, freeze, or fawn. Did you all know there's a new fourth category, fawn? You've heard of fight, flight, freeze, right? Fawn is the fourth category. That's the category where we try to appease somebody and compliment and, and make them feel so that they won't hurt and strike out and lash out at us. So you often see this in relationships where one person's abusive. The abusee is complimentary and kind. Can I get you a drink? Do you want, can I put your feet up? You want Just to make you feel okay so that person does not lash out. You see that a lot when... What, there was a great example that I heard just recently where the boss of the organization is always giving demands and ordering folks around and the employees are like, this is not the way that we work well together. We're not gonna be productive in an environment like this, but nobody says anything because the boss's personality is so powerful and so strong. So everybody goes around and compliments the boss. Oh, you have such great leadership. I'm, I'm so glad, glad to work with you just so the boss doesn't get irate and furious at, at folks. So that's the fawn category, flight, fight, freeze, and fawn. Point being, when we're in that downstairs part of our brain, we're not in a position where we're thinking rationally. We're not making rational, reasonable decisions. We're acting on impulse. We're acting on instinct. So we're running, we're kicking, we're fighting to get away from this dangerous situation. We're getting away from this uncomfortable place, which ends up being the school office, the principal's office, and then I'm helping you get regulated again, and then we're talking through all our different options. Better question to ask was, what was the first signal your body was sending you that you were not okay? What is the first moment where you felt just a little bit off? Because that's the moment, my friends, bless you, that's the moment that we want our kids to acknowledge and capitalize on. Because when they first start to feel a little bit funny, and you heard Wendy say earlier, her ears get red, and all y'all have different responses to stress, right? Some of you flush, some of you start, to, how many of you, your peripheral vision starts to close in? And all you can see is something. How many of you see a particular color when you get irate and kind of lose your mind and flip your lid. Like for me, it's yellow. Everything turns yellow. So this floor is super triggering. So you've got something happens to you physically, biologically, right? And something happens to our kids physically and biologically. We want them to feel it. We want them to know what it is. So we need to teach them what baseline feels like first. And I would encourage you in moments like the, uh, 
the kayak video or whatever form of meditation or just mindfulness to recognize what it feels like to be at baseline and to be okay. I think all of us could explain what it feels like to flip our lids and to totally lose our minds and lose connection to emotional uh, ownership, right? We want to know the steps in between. We need to know the gradients. We need to know what it feels like to be just starting off because that's when our kids need to get up and get a drink of water. That's when our kids need to have that stress ball. That's when our kids need to stand on one foot and lean forward and have a scoop of peanut butter. Whatever the thing is, and it doesn't matter what the thing is, it really doesn't. We often profess, take your kids to the buffet line of, of self-regulation tools. Let them try everything because just like each of us experiences stress uniquely, each one of our kids and each one of us as adults regulates differently. We all need different things to regulate. Can you imagine if I handed everybody a stress ball right now and I said, this is your regulation tool for the year. Sanctioned by the superintendent, you get one stress ball. That's all you get. That We're a stress ball district now. All right. That's actually how they refer to our district in neighboring districts is that's the stress ball district. So can you imagine? Some of you would be like, that's perfect. That's all I need. And others, you like, I am throwing the stress ball at anyone that comes near me, right? So we want to let our kids acknowledge all of them and have all those tools applicable to them. And it's not just kids. It's us as grownups, too. I was going through a school not too long ago where I was walking with the principal down the hallway of the school. We were headed from the office down to a classroom where we were meeting a team. And we're walking down the hallway and classes are in session and doors are open and teachers and kids are waving as the because, you know, when you walk with the principal down the hallway, it's like walking with a celebrity, right? Paparazzi appears out of out of lockers taking pictures. And so we're walking down the hallway and one teacher doesn't wave as we go by. One teacher gives the principal this signal. Right. And it was amazing. This is the value of having a common language. The principal elbows me and says, come on. And I'm like, what? And we walked into the classroom. And it was almost like a WWF scene where the teacher tapped out and the principal tapped in. And the teacher left the room and the principal just kind of came in and said, all right, boys and girls, what are we working on right now? And started and did what principals do, which is pretend to know what they're doing when they go in a classroom. <laughs> And, it, and it, what are you doing? What are you working on? What's your learning objective? How communicate? How clearly was it communicated by your teacher prior to the lesson? No, I'm just kidding. And, and just kind of going through the, the, being in the classroom and getting a sense for what's going on, asking kids to share what they're working on. All right, well, while you're working, let me see. A couple minutes later, the teacher came back, gave the principal this signal. And the, the principal was like, all right. And we left and we walked down the hallway. And so I remember, I remember vividly asking the principal, I said, all right. So that was smooth. And what are you going to do with that? Are you going to have a conversation with the teacher later about what was going on? You know what happened? And the principal said, and I got this was awesome. That's up to the teacher. Right. If the teacher needs to talk and, and go through that. OK, well, then we'll go through it. If not, I'm glad that I could have been there during that moment to help that teacher out when that teacher needed that moment. And that's part of the beauty of having that common language and that common understanding. Clearly, there had been conversations beforehand, right? That as a staff, sometimes we just need a break from this. And sometimes we need another adult to help us out with that. And all that turned out, all the teachers in that building have a trusted ally. So at any given moment, a teacher could go out in the hallway, or go across the hall or go next door and say, hey, I need a moment. And that teacher or a teacher on prep or could call the office and say, hey, can you send someone who's on prep down to my And they could they cover for each other in a safe way for a couple of minutes to go do that. Now, the reason this is important is because we all experience stress. Education ranks every single year as one of the top three most stressful professions. It's, thank goodness it's buffered by the high pay, right? I mean, so at least we have that at the end of the day. So it's a high-stress high profession. It's a challenging profession. It's a high-stakes profession. Can you imagine anything that's more high-stakes than this? It, and it's high-stakes in the sense of the decision I make in this moment isn't the most important decision in the world. It's the compilation of all the decisions I make in all the different moments that affect the trajectory of every single one of our kids. That's high stakes, my friends. That makes a big difference, what we do. And there's a complementary reality that we're all human beings. And contrary to what you may have read on Twitter, we as educators are not perfect. So we have permission 
to lose connection with our emotional ownership. We have permission to flip our lids because we're human beings. Research out of the Circle of Security Project would tell us you only need to get it right three times out of 10 with any, any child. So it kind of like, it's the same as uh, getting to the Hall of Fame in baseball. If you bat 300, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. So if you get it right three out of 10 times, you're going to the Hall of Fame. Now, here's the asterisk that goes with that. As long as you're willing to and then do repair the other seven, as long as you come back to that kid and say, hey, my relationship with you is more important than whatever you just did or whatever I just said. So let's make sure we're OK. If you do that the other seven times, you only have to get it right three times. So you have permission to flip your lid. Question becomes, how do you repair and how can you come back to that place? And do you have a common mechanism for supporting each other on campus? So I wanna ask you a question. Do we have time for a story? Okay, do we have time for a story? We have four minutes. I'm trying to figure out which story I wanna tell. Here's the, here's the one I, that I had planned to tell. And so we'll do this. I want you to think for a second, rather than me tell a story right off the bat, I want you to think for a second. Think about the last time you went not just to hear, but flipped your lid at work. The last time you had a significant emotional reaction to something at work. A kid, a parent, an administrator, a teacher, a colleague, a, a technology issue, a, who knows what it was, right? I want you just to think about it. And I'm not going to ask you to share what your story was. I'm going to share mine real quick. And then I'm going to give you the five causes of our, the five most frequent causes of our own lid flips so that you can be aware of them. Because you heard from Dan Siegel, if it's predictable, it's preventable. So we want to make sure that you know what maybe sets you off so that you can prepare for that in advance. So I'm going to tell you a story. So as a, a principal, I get a, um, we're doing a, an evacuation drill, so we send all the kids out on the field, and then I get a call on the walkie-talkie. Almost all my principal stories start with, I get a call on the walkie-talkie. It's the weirdest thing. So I get a call on the walkie-talkie, so-and-so and so-and-so are monkeying around out on the field. Uh, we're going to send them to the office. And I'm like, dude, that's the exact wrong thing to do in an evacuation drill. You don't send kids back to the school during an evacuation drill. Maybe I'll meet them outside. Too late, they're already on their way. All right. So the kids get to the office, and you know how important evacuation drills are, right? We're trying to make it automatic for kids that you go off to, to man, whatever. So here these two kids are. They sit down in the chairs in my office. And so I'm, I'm talking to them, you know, like a responsible, fatherly figure. Boys, uh, come on now. And one of them is just laughing and joking to the other one, like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe this. And so then I'm, I'm starting to get here, right? My ire, all right? So I raised my voice a little bit and I started doing angry dad talk. You know, I'm clenching my teeth the whole time and they never leave each other while I'm talking to these boys. And then one of them says, get a load of this guy. What's his problem? And then I went full mouth, right? And I'm spitting and I'm yelling and I'm barking at the kids. And I won't forget this. This kid looks up at me and he's like, who do you think you are, my dad? And I'm thinking, actually, I was trying to be fatherly, but... Uh, my response was, no, because if I were your dad, I would have raised you differently and you never would have acted like this in the first place. And I'm going through all this stuff, right? And I remember vividly Jody Franks. She was a first grade teacher in the school. She walks in the side door of the office while I'm barking at the kids. And she says, are you all right? And I looked at her and I said, yeah, I'm fine. It's just these boys in the fire drill and I'm just so mad. And she says, I wasn't talking to you. I was acting in such a way, I was so disconnected to my emotional core that my teacher was afraid for these boys in my presence. It was an eye opener for me about losing, flipping your lid. And how, how you knew her, Dan Signal in, in, in his video say, we can act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. I thought I was trying to teach these boys a lesson and that was going to do it. Turns out I was scaring the bejesus out of my teachers. So here are the five different sources. So my story and whatever your story might be, I want you to think about not what your story was. I want you to think about where your story came from, why your lip flid may have happened, right? So five things. One is energy. Anybody in here ever felt tired before? Yeah. So when you're tired, you tend to not be at your best. Right? When you're not getting your basic physical needs met, if you didn't get enough sleep, didn't get enough food, didn't get the right food, it can affect you. Anybody here ever been hangry before? 
Anybody ever been hangry and actually told your kids, hey, I'm hangry, by the way, just so that you know what today's going to go like unless somebody comes up with some graham crackers or a latte, right? So not getting your basic, basic physical needs met, being tired. And as teachers, we reserve the right to be tired whenever we want. It doesn't have to be a Monday in November. It doesn't have to be a Thursday afternoon in April. We can be tired at any given moment, any day, any month, for whatever reason. Two is our history. How many of you have ever, or maybe in your situation right now, you don't have to raise your hand to this, just think about this. How many of you, your lid flip happened because you're interacting with a kid that you've worked with so many times already? Not you again, right? And because of your history, or because you go out and on, how many of you have ever had, and again, don't have to raise your hand to this, I like to do that, but that's just me raising my hand. How many of you ever had playground duty and it's always the freaking slide, right? You're like, it's a gravity machine, folks. Walk up the stairs and come down the slide. You don't go up the slide, right? So how many of us have that particular place or that particular kid or, oh my gosh, that same family is calling again? What kind of society have we come to that our phone, we look at our watch and we're like, oh, our phone is ringing. Anyway, so it could be history, right? It could be, oh no, I'm doing this again, right? How many of you have, and you put this up on one of your slides when we were talking about um, Zaretta Hammond's definition of culture, about how many of you have a different idea about effective parenting than some of your kids' parents, right? And that's a hard uh, ivory tower to come down out of, isn't it? How many of you believe that your style of parenting is right and obviously the parent's wrong, right? So it's, it's a difficult internal wrestle that you have to do to realize that, hey, Different parents have different ideas about parenting than I do. Our belief systems matter. We have to be aware of what we believe and we have to be aware of how that affects the way we interact with other people and, and process situations that are happening around us. Because a lot of times our, we get triggered because our belief systems get threatened or something around us runs contrary to our belief systems and that throws us off and we experience that disequilibrium and we're not okay with that. How many of you have ever written the perfect lesson plan? You, all your hands should go up right now, okay? How many of you have ever written the perfect lesson plan and then when you went to implement it, it didn't quite go as planned, right? That disconnect, sometimes we have expectations for how things are gonna go and when that disconnect occurs. How many of you have ever thought you had a great relationship with a parent? And you get a, a notification, hey, this parent wants to come in and meet with you at 3.30 today. And you're like, great, I love this parent. And that parent comes in, hell on fire, ready to get you. I don't know, is that an expression, hell on fire? Ready to come and get you and just comes instantly attack mode. And you're like, well, well, wait, wait. And then you flip your lid as a result because you're like, I thought we had a good relationship. And now you're angry and you're yelling and that set me off, right? So whatever our expect when our expectations aren't met, sometimes that's what gets us. And there's a fifth category that we don't often talk about, fear. How many of you have ever been set off because of your fear that something might happen as a result, right? Your fear that, oh gosh, what if the principal comes in and I look like a fraud, right? Fear that I don't know how to get this kid under control and I don't know what I'm going to do about this, fear that this lesson's not going to go well, my scores aren't going to be good. There's some kind of fear that plays into our decision making and that can set us off when fear enters the equation. So like I said, I don't need you to tell the story. I want you to take about 30 seconds and just process which of those five do you think was primarily responsible for that lid flip situation that you thought about? And then just be mindful of the idea that if that's something that sets you off, you may want to be attuned to whether or not that's coming up in your life so that you can mitigate the likely stress that accompanies it. So take 30, 45 seconds to just process that. Again, if you're a reflective processor on your own, that's great. If you talk with somebody else, lean over and have a conversation, that's great. And I'll bring you back in 45 seconds.
All right, ladies and gentlemen. In the spirit of uh, trying to match Wendy's abundance of resources that she shared with you, I'm going to share with you one, one resource. Um, it is about the brain. It is how we can keep our brain strong and withstand more stress. Yes, I would like to reduce the amount of trauma and stress that our world provides and that our school systems provide and that our societies provide. Unfortunately, because that's not under control, what is in our control is how do we develop resilience and how do we develop the ability to withstand great, and it's almost sad to say it out loud, we want to give, equip our kids and ourselves with the ability to withstand tougher and tougher situations and more and more stress in their lives. And we can do that. So if you go, and the blog that Wendy referred to uh, is at fosteringresilientlearners.org. It's the name of the title of our first book, Fostering Resilient Learners. Dot org, And then if you click on the, the blog, there are actually two different things, two different blogs that are in there. One is Healthy Brains, it's up to you. And that's where we go through the 10 things that we can do to teach our kids and to teach ourselves to be stronger and healthier so our brains can withstand more and more stress. And it has some research citations to it as well. And then the second one is a blog about um, how our brains can withstand stress. So I actually do a hand model of the brain as well and talk a little bit about how important that is that we teach it to our kids as well. So fosteringresilientlearners.org, go to the blog, check that out. Uh, I will be here tomorrow as, oh, I'll be here all day today and tomorrow as well. Wendy's just here today. She's got two breakout sessions this afternoon. You know what a fabulous person she is and what a terrific presenter and the resources she has. You also have additional amazing presentations and great content filling up today and tomorrow. So I, take, I urge you to take advantage of that as, uh, as much as you can. I'm also looking forward to coming back in two weeks, what is it, the 16th, to do the opening keynote for the whole staff in a couple of weeks. And I, I saved my one other story for that. So I'm gonna, I'll share that story that day. I, I, I hope you all appreciate it, uh, the sacrifice I'm making for you. I, thanks so much for having me here today. I hope this session has been useful for you. Oh, thanks so much for the spontaneous applause. Check out your little yellow booklets to find out what session you're going to, what you want to learn about, where you're going, why that's important, and enjoy your learning.